Okay, so my name is Brendan Wilkins. I'm founder and co-CEO of Dig Ventures. We're a platform that enables civic participation with archaeological research. And people can get involved with us um, from all over. They can join us online. They can jump in the trenches with us and dig for a day, a weekend, or longer. Now, um, Emily, Naomi, and Adam have set the brief for us today to think about heritage, both in the general terms and archaeology and its sustainability, but also the sustainability of our industry. Now, today I'm going to present an alternative participatory uh, model that really addresses the notion of sustainability, but also thinks about what a regenerative model for archaeology could look like, realising both the how and the why of the MPPF's ambitions. Now, I'm going to begin by talking about deep time. That was our social and entrepreneurial response to the pandemic. I'm going to outline the results from our prototype in that project, map out the next stages in the roadmap with our development programme, and really try and draw that out and think more broadly about the relevance for the future of archaeology. Now, Deep Time was an experiment with collective intelligence. There was also an artificial intelligence component to this. I'm not going to talk about that today, though. I'm going to talk about the participatory um, side of it, where we encourage members of the public with no previous training um, to uh, join us and identify new archaeological sites and features using LIDAR and satellite imagery. Now, the idea for Deep Time came to us as a consequence of the pandemic. With no digs happening anywhere, our physical participation fell by some 75%. But as we opened up our digital activities, as we repackaged our courses as uh, virtual digs and had virtual pub quizzes and all manner of virtual fun, our digital participation grew by some 3,100%. This included one event, which was a digital virtual dig that lasted some six weeks, that attracted 11,000 people from 90 different countries. So through this, we saw two things happen. In our forums and our chat groups, we saw people coming together to help each other out through this moment of um, personal, national, and international trauma. It seemed that archaeology was the medium, but the message was really people coming together in pursuit of a common cause to help each other out. Secondly, we saw some really great archaeology being done. Many of our, event, our events reached into um, live digital repositories, either our own digital repositories or national repositories. Um, and we found some great archaeology found. There was one particular instance where a furloughed wedding photographer called Chris Snedden discovered what we thought was a previously unknown Neolithic Henge monument, which to us was the stuff of our archaeological dreams. So with that, we thought, you know, how can we roll this forward into a post-pandemic future? How can we take our, our model, which has hitherto been focused on the digging part of our archaeology, and roll that upstream into the planning and reconnaissance stage of our work? And crucially, how can we involve and include as many different kinds of people as possible? Now, this is a model that Nesta calls collective intelligence. It's the combination of people, data, and technology to help us make better, smarter decisions in the present. And I'm delighted to say that they actually then funded us to devise a prototype CI model um, for archaeology. Now, the challenge we took to Nesta was a spatial planning issue. How do we apply collective intelligence to tackle social and environmental impacts on buried archaeology that are happening at a far bigger scale than our professional community can meet alone. To test this, we partnered with Durham County Council using a 220 square kilometre study area reflecting the watershed of the River Skern. Now, the core innovation here is a participatory GIS embedded within an online MOOC or learning management system. Now, this enables participants to identify and label archaeological sites 
on LiDAR and satellite imagery. This is a depth rather than a breadth model of impact. Rather than, as many crowdsourcing projects attempt to do, get lots and lots of people to do something very, very small, we were taking a smaller group of people and investing time to, to teach them how to make professionally valid contributions and then scaling that model outwards to as many people as possible. Now, the first part of our experiment um, was around um, the data. We have two, two, two challenges, designing for data and designing for people. So that first part, could a collective intelligence model improve our ability uh, to find unknown archaeological features and improve what we know of known archaeological features using LiDAR and satellite imagery? So to address this, we had two different metrics, uh, the quantity of features identified and the quality of that data that was produced. Now the second part of our experiment, equal in importance, we wanted to know whether um, getting involved in a project like this would help people understand archaeology's role in the planning process. It's a, a participatory planning idea. Would it give them a sense of more control over those decisions um, that might ultimately impact their lives? Um, as well as that, we wanted to know whether it gave them a stronger connection to the landscape that they were studying. And our data for this was through two surveys, one undertaken before the project and one undertaken after. Now, just go on to that. So um, the, the participants, okay, so this is where many crowdsourcing projects actually fall down. Um, it's very difficult often to get people um, to join in a project. There's a build it and they will come um, mentality. But we had quite the opposite um, experience. We had nearly a thousand applicants for what was a hundred places, which we upped to a hundred and fifty. Now being so oversubscribed meant that we could be really um, thoughtful about how we uh, composed and created that community. So we uh, create a se selection methodology which was split equally amongst age, um, gender, socioeconomic background, and making, making sure that 25% of that participant group was non-white. Um, we called our, pa our participants pastronauts. That's as much as anything our community building idea, looking at LIDAR, it's kind of a bit like the surface of a moon, of the moon, and we were definitely going to experience turbulence. As you can see here, um, most of our participants had never touched archaeology ever before. So, that, so the first challenge was how we take a group of um, non-specialist uh, members of the public and get them to make professionally valid contributions equal in stature to uh, identifications we would make. And so we did this by nesting our participatory GIS in our learning management system. We took our crowd through a, a five-week um, program after which there will be two weeks of analysis of the map and two weeks um, validation of the map. We had a chat function based within this so that it wasn't just the, the responsibility just on, on our professional team to help each other, but the whole community helped each other. We were designing for collaboration rather than competition. So what were the results? Well, as we hourly refreshed our browsers so that it would move from a needing to be done blue into a fully an, an, um, validated um, green, um, we saw some amazing work being done. Um, to begin with, in the HER, there were 3,925 known sites in the study area. Now, the crowd added to this with a further 3,670 sites. 2,361 of those were entirely new, but the 1,300 that makes up the difference were just dots on a map before we began. So we polygonized and improved that data. So we have a 60% uplift in the known archeology. span Now as for the quality, now that's a difficult metric for us to get our heads around because there's no established methodology to do that with the HER. There's established methodologies to get the data in or quality as process, but an acceptance that some of our HER is very good and some needs improving. 
So we created a set of metrics around fidelity or closeness of match between the object and the thing. We created a metric called accuracy, which was closeness of match between the polygon and what was observed. And then completeness, which was how much of the metadata had been filled in. Starting on a score of zero, being terrible, and four being perfect, we could then create a percentage weighting against that data. So we saw that when we looked at the, uh, the accuracy rating for what the crowd had done, that came in at some 94% compared with an 88% for our baseline data. So we got to see that our methodology really, really worked. But what about that second question, the social impact piece? Well, to begin with, when we asked people how they understood archaeology in the planning process, some 6% knew nothing about it. 24% uncertain, 48% knew a little. By the end of the project, that had completely flipped, with 96% understanding archaeology, 50% strongly so. The same kind of flip when we think about how people connect with landscape. To begin, some 75% had, had no or a neutral connection to the study area. When that had finished, we had 75% of participants agreeing their connection had increased, 32%, strongly so. So this, in terms of our prototype, was really, really compelling. It's shown us that a CI uh, approach to archaeology's um, challenges can create a step change in data at an equal or higher quality than we currently rely on with a demonstrable increase in social impact. Now, this new approach to managing archaeology could have huge implications for how we move forward as a profession, particularly around challenges relating to net zero or climate change. And that's not just the very tangible impacts such as coastal erosion, but also a human response to those challenges, such as reforestation and peatland reclamation. In order to hit our net zero obligations, by 2030 we have to deal with some 700 square kilometres of landscape change a year, equivalent to one and a half HS2s. Every year we miss, more gets added onto the line. So this could, could work, but how do we get there? Well, this innovation spiral developed by Nesta is a really good way of visualizing a roadmap to get from a prototype with interesting um, outcomes, but clearly needs, needs more work to, to at the very end, um, system change. Now, our prototype sits very, very early on. It sits in that we see one to two. So the opportunities and challenges presented through the pandemic led us to, um, to, to think about different ways of moving forward, different ways of thinking about this. As we're moving into uh, the, the spark section of the spiral, we're currently around about um, number three there. So we received additional funding from Innovate UK to test this model in a real world example in partnership with the National Trust working one um, case study or mission um, on a coastal erosion site, one on a reforestation site, and one on a peatland reclamation site. Now, towards the end, I'm going to talk about that number seven, what perhaps that changing systems might look like. Um, but before then, um, I wanted to really frame uh, from the ideas uh, of change management you know, what, we, what we're trying to do here. So very often archaeologists or pretty much anyone thinks about these big initiatives or big challenges as um, technical problems. Technical problems are a business as usual problem. In order to address them, we generally need more money, we need more time, we need more experts. Well, we're definitely dealing not with a technical a problem. We're dealing with an adaptive challenge, something outside of our expectations, something that requires a collaborative approach in order to address this. And as you can see here, those obstacles to those two things are very much a cultural or way of thinking um, uh, barrier that's potentially in our way. 
Okay, so as, we, as, as I come into the last section of the presentation, I just want to talk about some of the different um, design uh, tweaks that we've made uh, to our platform. And we've started to model out the different users and personas within the platform, thinking about the different value propositions of each. As you can see, mission control, which is effectively us and our project partners, the National Trust in this instance, mission leaders being um, our, our super uh, uh, passionauts, the highly motivated passionauts, our main passionaut um, group. And then before anyone can enter into that, um, ability to make um, analysis and validations on a map, they have to go through a series of, of learning MOOCs for, when they're cadets. Passengers, well, that's any interested parties, interested stakeholders or members of the public. So we communicate with each group and we find a, a way for each group um, to get involved um, with the project. We've made changes to our participant dashboard as now our passionauts can look at different projects and get involved in different projects as well. We've made changes um, to our online course, refining through feedback through our original prototype so that we can refine that. One of the main things we've refined is having a monuments guide which can surface um, in page there as participants are making validations and analysis. And we've also looked again at the, the user um, journey through actually using the map and refine some of the tools to make that as easy as possible. The big step forward for us is this partner dashboard. So that's for the mission control, that's for our team and it's for the National Trust to see a project live as it's happening. They can see the participants of astronauts included, we can see um, our socioeconomic background of everyone involved, that's the designing for people and on the left there, the designing for data, you can see data coming through in real time, but also that uplift in quality as we've mapped out to begin with um, what our baseline quality is. Okay, so the final part of our innovation spiral is regenerative. It's our systems change. And our question really, my question is, you know, what might that look like um, for archaeology? Well, I think climate change definitely belongs in this area, it's an adaptive um, challenge. It's, it's not a business as usual problem and it can't be solved with a business as usual solution. Now there's a growing field called regenerative economics that goes beyond the idea that we should just sustain or conserve. Instead, we should design systems that incentivize regeneration and replenish resources. Now in this model, the economy goes through several stages. We have and shareholder value at the very end there, where economic health is typically defined um, by production and consumption, and that tends to disregard the true cost of pollution or depletion of natural resources. In the center there, we have the idea of stakeholder value, where those negative externalities are treated as impacts to be offset by doing good elsewhere. Archaeology likes to live there, it sometimes lives on the other side. And at the very end there, we have this idea of regenerative economics, shared value, focusing on building systems that nurture and preserve environments and ecosystems that are essential for planetary and social health. This is sometimes called donor economics, after the economist Kate Raworth, uh, Mariana Masakuto's mission economy also kind of sits in this. It's a very emergent field, but I think it's one that archaeology can learn a lot from. So what's stopping us getting there? Um, well, I think we have a set of operational instructions that has been passed down to us through the rescue revolution. We have this idea, it's associated with Cunliffe, but really he just chaired the meeting and put his name on the publication, that we can, we can move archaeology through a pipeline um, from level one through to level six. Now the difficulty when this gets marketized is we tend to sit over that side and this is kind of nice to have. That's painkillers, these are vitamins. And unfortunately, people don't like paying or eating for vitamins. 
So what would a regenerative model for archaeology look like? Well, moving from that pipeline to more of a platform approach, you can see that this maps onto the workflow of deep time. We begin with our baseline, our collation of available and open data. We move that into an internal review where we map the quality of that baseline. We then move that into the crowds portal where we mobilize a range of people, ideas and insights. And that's number four. That's our desk-based stuff. But then moving over into the field, we have an information output where we can see field checking um, through non-invasive survey sits at number five. Our answers is when we put a trowel in the ground and dig a hole in it. And then that goes back into our data repository and then back out again in a continuous growing cycle. Grand. So I'm gonna finish, finish now. Um, that's one, my take on one foot in the past, one foot in the future. Um, I'd like to thank all of the partners and funders that have helped us get this work off the ground. And thank you all for listening.